Yeah, no, there, there was a transgender YouTuber that he got in a scuffle with, and he called her uh, a demonette of Slanesh, uh, the god of hedonism and pleasure. In Is that... That's 40K. Um, okay. Yeah, so, you know. Sounds like a Nothing good, but the most serious of political discourse here. Uh, the god of hedonism and pleasure? Yeah. That sounds like a... Yeah. Yeah, like, <laughs> exactly. Sounds, that's good. That's like... Is that even, like, a bad thing? I bet they don't even want to fight people. Nah. Yeah. And then you get these holy crusaders from (laughs) space camp or whatever. Space camp. The space camp counselors. Is that that a movie? That's Warhammer 40K. Is that... Right? Is that a space... (laughs) The sleepaway camp, like the... (laughs) Space space camp. Space camp. (laughs) I'd watch that. I'd watch Space Camp. I wish like there was so many like eighties or like seventies things that just like continued the way that Friday the thirteenth did to the point where they got to space for no reason. Uh there, that would be fucking wonderful. Hmm. I'm trying to think of other examples. Like and they probably shouldn't do Mad Max in space because that's a little too good. Um but that'd just be space balls. It's just driving through space in an RV. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of would be. Um you know what might be fun in space, too, with the goofy outfits in the camp? What? Uh, the movie we're doing today on the Spectator Film Podcast, The Warriors. The Spectator Film Podcast Holiday Special. Is it a holiday? I don't know. I just said that. It's a holiday somewhere. Anyway, hi, guys. Nice to be back. I'm Max. I'm Austin. And uh, today we're talking about The Space Warriors. <laughs> it's a movie I had never seen before, but I'm glad Max chose it. It is about a group of men in tights and nothing else who must <laughs> run all vests. the way. Well, they have vests. Yes. Or, I'm sorry. Uh, very small vests and lots of hair. And they have to run all the way back from Brooklyn to the moon. That's got to be like 50 or 100 miles. Yep. <laughs> That's how close the moon is, right? No. Yep. In all seriousness, we're doing uh, the Warriors today. The Warriors. You got to say it right. Say it. Warriors come out to play. <laughs> perfect. That's perfect. I love it. Um, yes, this was my pick. Uh, to give you a little history, as you might know if you listened to last week's episode, I was away. Um, and you were at space camp. Yes, as I was we in space were just camp. discussing. While I was in space camp, I was talking with a friend, and we started talking about uh, different movies, cult movies, some of which that we thought hadn't aged well in particular ways. Um, One that we did was a movie we'll probably do way off in the future, um, which is a Rocky Horror Picture Show. So I was thinking of doing this movie and Rocky Horror Picture Show as a double feature, but Austin correctly pointed out to me that if we're going to do Rocky Horror Picture Show, we're going to go 150% on that one. This is the only way to do it. Yeah, we need to completely, completely... Get involved in that. And the movie on, this, on this short week, it would have been appropriate because as I was informed, yesterday was like the finale of RuPaul's. And it's like, if you're going to muster that like, like the drag. unstoppable drag energy for your episode, this but would have been a good time. That's for something it, we were talking about because yeah. there's an interesting discussion in the transgender community about how problematic Rocky Horror is to a degree. So I thought that'd be interesting to talk about. And then we started talking about The Warriors, a movie that is fun. It has this wonderful colorful world it's a beloved cult film there are some aspects of it that haven't aged that well um which we'll be talking about i would say i do enjoy this movie i find it fun to watch i like the goofy like we all have themed gangs and we're roman new york like it's some sort of fantasy land if we were more clever i'm sure we'd come up with lots of fun jokes about themed gangs that don't make an appearance in this or well, a cut well we made our own vests for this episode you guys can't see it but we have a the we're the spectators um so we we just sit back we and watch cut all out the other, all just the other cut gangs. out other people's eyes and put them all over ourselves no we just sit back and watch the other gangs fight we don't really have any turf we're a shooty gang yeah but i'm saying our outfits we're we're kind of yeah but we don't fight anybody we're worse than the orphans we only have two people um even the orphans have like 30 but Anyway, I, yeah, so I chose this film. I, like I said, I enjoy it. I saw this film for the first time, I want to say when I first went away to college. So I was like 1920 and. That was a long time ago. Yes. 1920. And 
I did really like this movie. This was sort of like, I saw this and I was just like, eh, I, I love all this, but I wasn't like super enamored with it. I kind of saw it. I'm just like, I understand why this has a cult following. I like it. I don't really need to see this again anytime soon. Um, then I saw it again for the first time last year when my friend mentioned that he had never even seen the Warriors. Uh, he'd only ever heard of the video game. Made by uh, Rockstar, the Grand Theft Auto people, which I've heard is oh, good. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, which I've heard is good for the time. I never played it. I don't know much about it, but sure. It makes sense that there was like a Grand Theft Auto-esque game based off of this. But so I instantly said that, oh, yeah, we should watch that. And then rewatching it, I'm just like, oh, I still really like all the creative stuff this movie does. But like some things just like mainly the portrayal of women is some yeah women in this film when it exists is ugh. and also just I know that there was controversy regarding like the portrayal of gangs is just like this fun group of all dressed together friends or whatnot but I don't know what's your experience with this movie Austin um I watched it for the first time I think was it last year is the year before is in the last two years I watched this movie for the first time in the last two years uh although of course, I'm sure, as is the case with both of us, we had some degree of cultural awareness of this movie before we watched it for the first time. It's kind of hard to avoid that. Yeah. Um, you're talking about the uh, Rockstar game of this, and yeah. even just talking about GTA in general, I think those games are huge, obviously, and take a lot of inspiration from movies. And even if it's indirect, I think this movie in finds its way. I could totally see this movie specifically influencing that stuff, yeah. too. So I think this movie influences a lot of things and that you're going to well, have... there's an, even a spinoff series, or not a spinoff, but like a, what started off as a ripoff of Grand Theft Auto called Saints Row that like fully embraced its like warriors thing and just like everybody had their own like goofy themed gang. And sure. Went off the rails with that. I mean, this is, this is a very specific tone and idea uh, sort of for this movie and more specifically like a specific conception of what gangs are yeah. in this movie. And, uh, yeah, I definitely had some sort of cultural awareness of it before I watched it. But when I watched it, I think I was mostly struck by the aesthetics of the movie. I thought it looked beautiful and I still think it looks beautiful. And I think I'm going to agree with you about a lot of some of the things that make this movie dated. Although I think there's a difference between a movie being dated and being of its time. And I feel like the things that date it are mostly the female characters, um, Whereas everything else doesn't really feel so dated to me as it feels yeah. like of its time. Also, not all the female characters, but the two most prominent ones, I would, or two of the most prominent and focused on ones. Uh, there are moments that, yeah, there's one moment in particular that. I has, mean, we can talk about it during the movie. Yeah. But I mean, there's, it's okay to have a movie that has shallow female characters, but there's a, also a difference between doing that in a way that is like just reinforcing sexism yeah. thoughtlessly you know or making it interesting and here i think it's just not interesting and i think it just reinforces sexism yeah. we're gonna talk about this during the movie i think this is not a perfect movie although i agree with max i think it's good and there's a lot of things i like about it um and i totally understand why it has arrived at this sort of cult status and i think that's justified but also uh it, i think it misses quite a few opportunities to expand on its story or at least um, open up some storytelling possibilities in the premise. And I think that sort of puts a limit on it for me. I think it, I think it's a very ambitious movie that could have like reached a new level if only they had reorganized a few scenes um, to sort of interrogate their premise a little bit more and interrogate, you know, the idea of these gangs. But as it exists, I think it's a very, interesting and probably unique movie. So I still think it's worthwhile what we have. And I'm glad you chose it because I think it's a neat movie to talk about. No, it's, it's fun. Um, also like this movie's called an action movie, a lot, which is not true. Yeah, no, the action as has been pointed out by other people that the action is the weakest part of this movie by far. Um, you were talking about the expansion of the world. I th honestly think that for the most part, I kind of like the fact that like all the other gangs just sort of exist and right. we're introduced to them like, oh, they know who they are already. Well, let me clarify. It's not so much expansion of the world, but expansion of the premise. Like, I don't need more gangs or anything, 
but I do want them to explore this premise more. And we'll talk about that more during the movie. Well, I'm sure that they'll explore it in the inevitable remake that's going to be coming out. In the I'm surprised they year. haven't already, yeah. to be honest with you. I wouldn't be surprised if it's not already in pre-production. And it's just like... going to look like shit because they shot this on location and you can tell. And that's yeah. part of this movie's beauty. Uh, but you know for the new one, whenever they do re- remake it, it's just going to be on some sort of studio subway or whatever. In Neo New York City after the apocalypse and it's all grungy now i don't know um you think they'll do like an oceans eight and it's all women that could be it um we, we'll, that could potentially we'll spin, be more interesting we'll yeah, talk about you, that you could spin the wheel of what marketing ploy is hollywood gonna use to try to get people to see this yeah because i think neither of us were 100 percent opposed to a remake of this if you did it in the right way and we'll elaborate on some of those ways that potentially would make this movie even Interesting. Though, yeah, even though I'm yeah, still never going to see the Suspiria uh, remake. Which I just don't understand. Yeah, I know. I, I've acknowledged it's stupid, and I gained nothing from doing it. But the if you're going to remake The Warriors, maybe do it that way, of just like take the base idea of it and put it in a completely different direction, but like in an artistic... Get the director of Mamma Mia. <laughs> you know what? If they made The Warriors a musical, I would see that in a second. I'm sure they... Ha- it, has Broadway not made the Warriors a musical? This I, is so close to being like a Grease situation. We'll I let feel you like. know after the break if anybody has attempted to make a Warriors musical. If and if not, we'll get started right away. <laughs> yes, trademark Spectator Film Podcast 2019. The Warriors musical in space. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think it's yeah far past time that we should begin the podcast. Right. So I have to ask you, Austin, can you dig it? I can. Well, I guess I shouldn't say anything. In that Can scene. you dig it? I, I mean, in that scene, technically what happens is they don't, they just sort of go like, ah, and they don't like say okay, yes. Okay, you know no. what? I can dig it for you. Let's go. All right. Uh, so we looked it up. There is, in fact, uh, no Warriors musical in planning or any stage. So we'll get right on that. Um, or if we have any industrious listeners... Contact us and we'll sell you the rights for five dollars. Um, because we definitely own the rights to that. You know, if if we really own the rights to this movie and this story, maybe we would eradicate the director's cut of this. <laughs> yeah, but which, we'll, by the way, we're not watching. Thank that. God, uh, and neither should you. Don't. It's not. It's not the worst. It's just kind of extra for the sake of being extra. But anyway, we're going to start off with this wonderful shot. I say wonderful too much, but of the Ferris wheel on Coney Island, which looks great. And then we get sort of this amorphous, as you pointed out, like abstract, abstract geometric sort of thing, just pulling in subway. I mean, obviously it's a subway, but the way they shoot it is very specific. I think it does a great job of introducing the tone and uh, I, I guess the expectations of the audience for this movie. It lets you know that this is not, real and it does this purely through the abstract visuals at the beginning you know this is a movie that is relying on style more than it is trying to be realistic yeah because really there's lots of things in this movie even within the tone it establishes that are just laughable and this shot is just beautiful this is such a beautiful movie uh i think the aesthetics of this movie are not um something that that well i guess it, i'm wrong i was going to say that maybe that's undervalued or underappreciated in terms of this movie's influence and it's mostly like the aesthetics in terms of the costumes and idea of gangs that you see copied yeah. but i think visually this movie definitely you could say that there's a lot of movies that copy the visuals of this movie and not just this movie but some of walter hill's movies at this time in general uh this is he did a, go on to direct a musical so oh yeah he did didn't he uh it was not his next movie i think it was the or was it i don't know all i remember is that the movie he made before this is the driver i don't know if you've seen that that's a very good movie um i like that movie a lot more than this movie um i haven't seen that movie in a while but it, it there's a lot of things that stick out to me as similar uh, i think the performance styles are very similar I think uh, the sort of visual approach is very similar. And I think that movie is a little bit more successful at some of the things this movie does. But uh, this movie is definitely still beautiful. And as we'll see, 
it's one of the great subway movies. This yes. movie has amazing subway sequences, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they were shooting it on location. And thank God, because a lot of the movie takes place in the subway, so if yeah. the scenes were bad, it would be just be kind of miserable. That's the entire movie, basically. Oh, no. Uh, street, Yeah, Streets of Fire, his musical, came out in 84, so a bit after this. My favorite gang, the Mime Gang. We see them at the meeting for a little bit, and we never see them again, very unfortunately. I, I would dress if I had to dress up as one of the gangs from this, it would probably be the mime gang. Yeah. I well, I, I guess the baseball furious are kind of mimes. Yeah. They don't ever say anything. They're pretty. I, I'm pretty sure they're fan favorites. Like I know a lot of people like them. They certainly are. Um, we, we have the scare random people on the subway gang. That's how you met your first ex-wife, right? You just I, walked I, up to her and we're like, yeah. <laughs> you need to stop doing this. <laughs> I'm sorry, I won't talk about your ex-wife anymore. So one thing, I know this is a nitpick, but I'm genuinely curious if anybody like knows in the lore of the warriors, are there supposed to be more than nine warriors? Because the entire time they're like, we have to get back to Coney Island, and they make a big deal out of the fact that every gang can only bring nine members. It's, is this something that has lore? That's the thing. What is What What if this exists outside of this? The Rockstar game, I guess. Um, but... I, I don't know. It's just an interesting thought. Hold on a second. Are there comic books of this? Just, I feel like there are. I don't know. But like, I feel like there are comic books of this movie like that go beyond it somehow. Possibly. I haven't read any. It's not something I would really get into. Oh, Rembrandt. Obviously, this movie stylistically is very uh, indebted to comic book style. And yes. that's something that would be made stupid and explicit in the director's cut. Meanwhile, but, but in the uh, in the theatrical release, it just remains the style of the movie. There's a difference between something that's just like literalizing style and making it dumb, and actually embodying that. Oh and yeah, I think. But we should really quickly mention what? that neither of us have. I don't think even ever seen a copy of the book. Never mind read it. That it's oh, based no. off of. Um, I don't Supposedly think that, very different. Yeah, that I know that. Um, something we'll talk about a lot over the course of this commentary track is the way that this movie is a lot playing a lot with the idea of mythologizing these characters and creating mythology. Whereas I get the impression that the original book is focused on demythologizing and humanizing the gangsters in a way that brings them down and destroys them. Whereas this movie is more mythologizing in a countercultural way and it's more embracing of of their identity as like the outsider. Yeah. And because of that, it's romantic in ways that are advantageous and interesting, but also problematic as we'll discuss. Oh, Ajax, you and just wanting to punch and fuck. That's your character. And surprisingly, he's one of the most developed warriors. Um, <laughs> everybody else is just kind of, that's the thing. Like this movie isn't an action movie. It's not even really a character piece because no, like Ajax is the most defined of the warriors and he's not particularly exposed like or portrayed in a positive light really even for this no. movie he's just kind of a idiot who starts fights when he doesn't need to and can't contain his erection but i think i understand why he's the character that a lot of people will gravitate towards as the best character because i think he is i just think he is the best character uh, it's the best performance out of the warriors yes i would say in the entire movie, I kind of want to give that to David Patrick Kelly. I know that you find his performance a little bit annoying at times, but I think that kind of fits with the character. I I think it's it also fits. I think it's very appropriate that he's annoying. But I also feel like James Remar is just doing the legwork on this performance in a way that's really I guess because successful. He's, he's in the movie more than David Patrick Kelly is, but um. David Patrick Kelly is more important, ultimately. Yeah. Ultimately, yes. And also, nobody's quoting Ajax's lines from this movie. They're quoting Cyrus's lines, and they're Max, quoting David Patrick Kelly. I know that's a lie, because I can... Listeners, here's a fun fact about Max. Almost every weekend, at least once, he's going to say something about shoving a baseball up your ass and turning people into a popsicle. One way or another, he says this to people, whether it's threatening whether it's uh, whether it's uh, as some sort of uh, extortion against somebody, uh, Max Listen, is Austin, a gangster. Don't, you don't don't kink shame me for what I get into on Saturday nights, but it's it's perfectly fine. Anyway, we're here at the meeting, and this is one of the things where 
the premise of the movie comes into play where you just get to, you get all these glory shots of all these fun, different gangs in different colors. Uh, oh, look, it's Doug Jones. If only. If I found out Doug Jones was just an extra in this crowd, I would like this movie even more. What is it, baby? Yes. <laughs> the baby gang. Why not? That's the joke that you can ulti- you could just do over and over again for this movie is just come up with the themed gangs. Uh, and we, we have the country bumpkin gang. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we were talking about this. I ultimately felt that if I was part of a gang in this, it would just be the lollipop guild. <laughs> We dress up like the those characters I from Wizard should, of Oz. We should quiet down a little and focus on the brilliant speech of Cyrus, which is, I would say, one of the highlights of this movie. And it is it is a good way to energize you for the start, because a lot of this movie is just like them running away in the dark for a bit and being confused about what's going on. So when you have this ener- yeah, energetic opening with all these colorful characters and then Cyrus preaching to them all very passionately, it really sets a fire on your ass to get you through most of the rest of the movie. Um, well, it's a, it's a classic sort of storytelling moment where they're going to have a big dramatic, I guess you could say it's a tragic, uh, sort of device, a tragic storytelling device where there's this big thing that's happening right at the beginning. And then something bad happens that just sets off the entire events. Right. Yeah. And it's like, it's the, the thing that makes it like a tragic, uh, tragic device is like the idea of it being, them on this like um sort of they have this like vector right and i'm talking about this entire community of of gang members right yeah they have this vector and they're going upwards right if everything he's saying in the speech pans out everything's going to improve in their life there's going to be less violence going to have more equality that it's basically talking about collective action and that's going to get to some of the stuff about the subtext of this movie and why it's of its time. Uh, but this is something where there's a lot of like promises being made in this speech. And then we can tell based on the reactions and what's going on in front of us that can you dig it? Yeah. They, like these people do dig it yeah. and there's a possibility they might be able to pull it off. Right. Well, we're not cause a good portion of the warriors, like by the end of his speech, seem to be coming around. There are a couple that are still just like, eh. But yeah, the only ones who don't seem to be on board with this idea are the rogues who are led by an insane psychopath who just kills people for the fuck of it. Um, I don't know how he's held control of that gang for so long. That's probably why. Yeah, I guess. But like his second in command is constantly questioning him like, dude, what the fuck are we going to do? And he's just like, hey, what the fuck? Who cares? But just the passion that he delivers those lines with just like the genuineness is fun. No, it's a good performance, but you think that like another saying Cyrus is the one and only, he's the only one who can like with the charisma, bring all these gangs together, but they all seem to be on board. So you think, uh, his success, his successor of discount blade would be able to get some of that sentiment and at least get some of the gangs united and then slowly take over all the other but Max, ones. he doesn't have magic. He doesn't. He's not the one and only. He doesn't even have eyes. That's where he wears those glasses all the time. But it's, it's, this is an interesting scene. And I, I, I do think, you know, the fact of this coming right at the beginning is important because it does set up that tragic mode, which uh, is right in line with the sort of Greek, uh, the appropriation of like Greek mythology yes, for this. which is a big theme throughout yeah. this f- yeah, film. Not the one you might think, although there are bits of that. Well, I think it's very on the nose if you're like prepared to look it for it. I think a lot of people will compare this to the Odyssey yeah, that's and there's certain elements about. that are similar to that. And this isn't a one-to-one recreation of any particular uh, Greek myth, but really th- both this and the uh, book it's based on are stealing from this thing called Anabasis written by Xenophone. I'm going to say, because I like saying Xenophone instead of Xenophon which is how you're telling me it's pronounced. Um, but we're just going to disagree on this. Team Xenophone all the way. Um, Xenophone sounds too much like xenophobe, so you can have fun with I was going to say it sounded like an instrument. The Xenophone. <laughs> yeah. Xenophone. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but they really like him. Um, but, yeah, so it's a story about this Greek guy who had to go to fight the Persians, as all Greek people had to do, I guess. And uh, he went to fight them 
you know, toward, the, toward sort of, the end of your life at 18, you had to go off <laughs> to fight the Persians. And uh, his name was Cyrus the Younger. And then he got assassinated or killed while they were sort of behind enemy lines in foreign lands. And then they had to do this whole retreat back to the ocean. And uh, that's, that's sort of the general idea of this movie as well. Although they take a lot of things from sort of Greek mythology. And that has a lot to do with the way this movie is not necessarily concerned with recreating that Greek story on a one-to-one level, but it's more just using that as a basis because it wants to take these, this idea of these gangs and mythologize them on its own, right? So it borrows that stuff to help create a new mythology that's similar but is its own thing as well. Yeah. And I think this is just, this is such fantastic managed mayhem. And just visually, the way they distinguish between this like crazy crowd and then all the cops who are coming in when they have so few cop extras, but they make it look like a lot of people the way they shoot it like this with them running vertically in a line. I think it's just well, great. They, have, they used all of their extra budget for this one scene when they have everybody in this little. Well, the fun fact about a lot of the extras in this entire sequence, even before Cyrus gets shot, is uh, that a lot of these are just gang people. Anyway. Okay. In fact, it's I'm going to link to a Village Voice article from a few years ago in the show notes. There's a lot of fun stuff about the making of this movie and how frequently they had to actually interact with like local gangs. Yeah, I guess if you're going to be filming in sketchy streets, it makes sense. But And, uh, you know, they were shooting this all on location and uh, they were shoot- they would have to have these gang things going on. In their movie, as heightened and silly as it seems to us at the time, uh, there it is just close enough for it to be a thing where real gang people would have to get involved in certain ways. Um, or people, you know, gang members would be attracted to production in ways that were troubling. <laughs> they often had to pay off gangs to shoot on certain locations, right? And also the fact that uh, they had to shoot everything at night, too. Yeah, so here's like the the rogue start a thing to pin it on the warriors because the warriors were the only ones who saw them do it. And the Shaolin monks elbow him to death. Yeah, it's very <laughs> funny. <laughs> <laughs> Just all elbow. <laughs> so were the cops going to come in if nobody got shot? Were they just going to be like, oh, that's convenient, all of the heads? I think in the book it's implied that it, it's more of a connection between the cops getting him like the cops are with one of the rogues oh, okay. who tipped him off and then gave him the gun somehow surreptitiously and he assassinated him and then the cops stormed in right after. Yeah. So like, that's the thing though. We should start that now. The cops, no cops are portrayed in any way with any agency other than they are a mindless evil force. In this yeah, because at the very least, the other gangs have faces. They have faces. They yeah. interact with them in unique ways. They have personalities. Um, there is no... God, that is so beautiful. I'm going to say this a lot, but just the way they balance like the highlights and everything, but keep everything looking gross, but also produced is really amazing in this movie. Yes, but uh, cops in this movie are portrayed as just sort of mindless drones that are bad. They don't have any agency. They don't need a reason to arrest the warriors when they run into them. They They just do, because that's... That's their purpose. Is In to- many ways, they are treated and behave like a gang, but they are they are not granted the level of individuality that the gangs have. You know yeah. what I mean? They're they're the embodiment of evil of that other society that these guys will never be a part of. But um, they're all the bad parts of other gangs. Yes, it's just they have none of the potential benefits of that. You know? Yeah, exactly. They're- they don't even have the choice to be different than the way they are. It's interesting. And I think, you know, there was some controversy with this movie yeah. at the time when it was released. And I think a lot of it had to do with, uh, do you know the original tagline for this movie? Um, which was the... Can you dig it? If that's not the tagline, no, that's fucked up. On the poster, the original tagline was, uh, these are the armies of the night. They are 100,000 strong. <laughs> they, could out, they outnumber the cops five to one. They could run New York City. Yeah, people were not happy about that with New York City being such a fucking shithole at the time. Right. So they were... A lot, there were protests and talks of getting this movie banned because of it. But well, it was pulled out of theaters prematurely. Because of that? No. Yeah. there was. It wasn't because this movie incited violence. 
but there were violent things happening at screenings, despite how much money it made a shitload of money, like right away, this movie. And, uh, there were violent things happening at screenings and, uh, it's not because this movie incited violence, but just that it was a big movie about gangs yeah. and specifically generationally. I think like compared to this to the Godfather, this is more a young person's movie than the Godfather, right? Yeah, Cause the Godfather is like old, like old traditional, but it's, yeah, it's steeped mobsters. in the past. Yeah. You know, of just like, well, we do this, but we have a sense of honor and yeah, people betray yeah. that, but eventually they'll get theirs if they do. Mm-hmm. Well, that movie is very different because it's about like the idea of how things grow into institutions yes you know but this movie is is you know much more about like the generational divide and and sort of living in a dystopian world where the old institution it's not even a question of whether or not it's good or bad it just exists and it's created these awful conditions for everybody to live in but uh you know it attracted younger people and gang people right so it wasn't yeah. people with like pretenses of being civilized. Or, well, that's a shitty way to say it. Yes, but like, but you know, attachments like, to the existing yeah structures of things. This is this is completely new. And even though that all these individual yeah things are working together for a common good, they're not forming society yet. Yeah. And the whole premise of this is the guy who's trying to form a, like a society and cohesive unit out of all of them gets killed in the first ten minutes of the movie. And you know what? I do. I, can we just pause to say how much Rembrandt sucks at this? Honestly, if I'm being honest, he's probably my favorite member of the Warriors because fuck Ajax and he's just, for whatever reason, if there are more than nine Warriors, they chose the kid who takes a very long time to graffiti things to be one of their representatives at the council. So good on them for that. Ooh, this is a cool shot. But yeah, so uh, here, what were we saying? Oh, about uh, the screening and everything. Yeah. I guess... Um, you know, when when you have people who are not in... It's like a mosh pit, basically, right? When this movie would play. That would be what would happen a lot. And you get people who are young and in gangs who are attracted to seeing this movie, and then violence would break out, right? So, you know, that was something that was happening, I think, with a little bit of frequency, and it it the, the people who were in charge of producing the movie got cold feet, and they pulled it. That's... I don't know. That's weird. Uh, one of them I know was Michael Eisner, who went on to be CEO of Disney. So, pull risky things makes sense, but I do love that in that opening scene where we're seeing all of the riffs. There's just like one schlubby white dude in the crowd that shows up for five seconds before they go back to just like the tough looking everybody else. What if he was the ultimate enforcer? Yeah, he's he's the best one. That schlubby white dude. Send in Bubba. <laughs> Um, but yes, we get, we get discount blade, the new head of the riffs. Um, and he is very dramatic with his chin. Yes. He's one of those actors. He could play Cyclops. (laughs) (laughs) Basically it looks like he's doing some sort of stretching or like weightlifting exercise with his mouth. Well, he has somehow if his mouth was holding a barbell, he has to overly articulate everything because he is wearing these gigantic sunglasses. So if he's going to be emotional, because this is serious. Yes. If he's going to be emotional, who are the warriors? Who are they? Yeah. I want to know. I do like that. Even though the movie is called the warriors. Okay. Well, one, we have to stop for the Greek chorus. This part of this is a great device. Yeah. And is it silly to be like, oh, yes, they send out messages over the radio with song requests for this lady um, that every gang is listening to the radio at any given time. But it's still like a wonderful it's a transitional thing. It's not silly. It's cool. It is cool. I'll give you that. And I'm not going to try to like compare this to John Wick just in terms of references too frequently. But the third John Wick did recently come out if you're listening to this future. And uh, I liked that movie as well. And I'm just very excited that three movies in a row have come out and they're all good. Um, but th- that's something that, you know, I think is a very cool touch that I like about John Wick too, is like, and John Wick one and John Wick three, but hey. like the John Wick series is how they incorporate things that have a, uh, sort of mainstream existence. And then they show you the subterranean existence it also has to communicate with this world you're not aware of. And it's like, that's cool stuff. If you can find quite clever ways to do it, there's a lot more of it in John Wick than in this movie, but I, I like the Cyrus interlude or the, uh, the chorus interludes because yes. of that, you know, it's very cool. Yep. All, all the gar- oh, yeah, gangs are starting to mobilize and get ready to f- fight off the warriors on the way home. Um, but do we want to say one more thing about the police? 
Yeah, sure. One thing I was well, we're gonna bring of. them up later when they become more relevant. But I guess so. I guess I was just thinking in terms of the the drama of this movie's release. Is like I was wondering, like, is it was a part of the uproar more because this movie didn't have reverence for the police than the actual violence in the movie? Well, yeah, they're not because con- there's not they're not people. Violence. There's not a character that's just like yeah. Listen, man, I only do this to feed my kids and wife, and I'm, yeah, I get you, like. No, they're all just mindless. Because even to compare it to The Godfather, yeah. you get crooked cops in that, right? But at least it's giving them a face, yeah. you know? In and this, they have no face whatsoever, and the movie just takes for granted that they're not... They're like subhumans. Well, we can argue about whether real cops are subhumans or not, but that's <laughs> a discussion for a different day. Um, I'll say for now is ACAB, but... We, <sighs> I'm 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 gonna have to resist like most of this commentary becoming like just oh look at all the different gangs because it's very cute. It's cute and like that's I think why ever like this movie endures in the popular imagination is just like Yeah, it's a good movie. Uh yeah. But like you would already like even if you were joking about like the Lollipop Guild and shit like that. There are people who do want to be like, what would my gang be? In this yeah, it, it has this universe? fun cosplay element to it. Yeah, but I know a lot of people do dress up as the Baseball Furies. That's a thing. Yeah, so. but, uh, you know, that's that's probably a good opportunity. I don't know if we should pause for this scene because I think this is an excellent scene that's going to come up with this bus. But I think that's one of the things we were talking about in terms of like, if you were going to remake this movie, what would be an interesting way to take it? And if we're starting with the outfits, we've already mentioned... You know, uh, we were talking about uh, um, Tim Curry. Yes. Rocky Horror. Yes, thank you. Uh, earlier, and like the drag energy. And it'd be like, you know what? A way to do this movie interestingly, if you were, if you had to remake it, you you make this queer punk more than just like... I'd be okay with like that. Like hyper-masculine punk, you know? Because you've got a way to do it. Because All these people have their identi- identity with their outfits, and it's like you make them own that in a way that this movie and this is movie less is punk on. to a degree. Like we have definitely we have this gang, which are like classic skinheads before Nazis co opted the term. Because for all you punk historians out there, uh, you probably already know this, but the term skinhead initially wasn't a racist neo Nazi bullshit thing. It was originally just an offshoot of punk that talked about politics a lot in England. And then, of course, Nazis co-opted it and made it the shitty thing that we know it as it today. But we know that these are the classic cool skinheads because they have different mem- yeah, different yeah, ethnicities throughout the gang. But yeah, if you update that for a queer punk feel, I think you could do something really interesting with that. It doesn't yeah. have to be the main characters. Listen, honestly, if you're going to remake it, you can keep the Warriors as this all-male, like, hyper-masculine gang. But I would like to see, like, different people on the other side of this good society more variety in the overall gang community that they have to interact i would love that that'd be great uh and 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 i think this movie sets up for that though is the cool thing because this movie is so much about the outfits already without really focusing on it right and the reason i'm keying in on the outfits is because that's a that's the part of the performative identity that i think makes something like a good vehicle for like making it queer punk, you know, because that's a big part of of making movies about characters living in this space. Right. Yeah. It's like that performance element of it. And I think I and I would be OK to capitalize on that. You because, could. And yeah. you could make the Warriors different. Yeah. Like, but I'm just imagining the preemptive shit storm online. What? Of just like if you end up making like the Warriors just like part of the LGBT community or make some of them women. Because you can do that in a really good way. You can do that in a corporate analyzed. We've calculated the amount of outrage that this will get. Corporate feminist. Yeah. Ghostbusters. Like, thing. Yeah. It's never bad to have more female representation in movies, but like a lot of it, as you'll see for stuff like the Ghostbusters remake and that, it, that's corporations relying on backlash from internet weirdos to sell their movie and get millions of dollars of free advertising. But also relying on like coding for like social justice values too. Well, yeah, that's, that's too. the thing. Yeah. Like you get the people who will be outraged by that kind of stuff. Who yes. will talk about it and have hot takes about it. And then you have people who feel that they don't agree with those fucking weirdos need to make their opinion more vocal. Yes. So they'll go see the movie, make it a hit. And, and the movie's just 
Yeah. Okay. The, movie, the movie's <laughs> average. People will forget about it in two years, but it will make a quadrillion dollars, so yes. it doesn't matter. And yeah, like, if you've been listening to this podcast, you know that we hold all the ideas of like feminism and acceptance in the highest of regards. But like, there's a difference between genuine social action and trying to fight for the oppressed, and like a corporation selling those values back to you as a marketing ploy. Like, or I mean, and and this is a whole other conversation. But just the 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 fact of like corporatization in general is incompatible with this movie. Yeah. You could not, if you were to remake this movie, almost as an artistic thing, I would be like, there has to be a limit on the budget of this movie. There has to be. Because if you make it too expensive, it ceases to be what it needs to be. Regardless of how you're doing it. Yeah. You know? Because eventually it gets a high budget Because why is, to why it. does this really feel punk? Because they shot on location. Because yeah. it was fucking... It's 1970. I mean, they, they ran didn't over even budget set that lot. fire. That was, <laughs> that was <laughs> just <laughs> going when they showed up. Yeah. But yeah, so that's an important part of it. And I think that would also be a, an important part of doing it if you were going to go in a queer punk direction, which I think we would both be in favor of you would also want to maintain that low budget feel because that makes it feel more alive. Yeah. You, know? you don't want it to be like corporation sponsoring pride now. And yeah. Just yeah. Like selling you. That's not going to work in this movie. Rainbow product. Shit not going to work. You. Yeah. Um, you need it to be from the ground up uh, and you need it to be like, you still need it to be aggressive, you know? And uh, who does this chick remind me of? Just like, I don't know. Uh, she reminds me your of sister. No. Oh, your mother. No. She reminds me like another character with a similar role in like another movie, but I don't know. Who, who does he keep calling? Is he calling like the actual leader of the rogues? Is he I calling, have no idea. Is he calling like, I just assume he's bragging because he enjoys getting over like one over on people. I think he's a really interesting character. And I think I like the change that, that is being made from the book where I, again, I'm not even sure if this is correct, but the idea that he's in it with the cops maybe. Yeah. I think I like it more that he's just a shit, yeah. you know, I think that that makes it more interesting because then his motivation is entirely internal and it makes him more of an interesting character because he's motivated by just character motivation instead of some sort of dangling shiny object out in front of him. Yeah, he's smart. He was down to assassinate Cyrus, but he's the only one who's just like, maybe we should take killing the warriors seriously rather than just sort of fuck around all night. Well, that's the other thing that I, I think could be improved by this movie. We sort of talked over that bus scene, but I think that's a really fantastic setup for that scene. It's well shot. It's well executed. It's just great. And there are a number, and that's really why I think this movie is a classic is because there's a number of set pieces like that that are just... God, they're just fantastic moments, right? And, uh, you know, even before, you know, the, the Americans knew about Mad Max, you have that sort of Mad Max moment where the bus is looking for them and it's going to run them down. I think that idea, and again, we haven't really said it yet, but this premise is amazing, right? So between the premise and some of these set pieces, I think that's where this movie succeeds the most. But I think it could succeed more because I feel like it leaves some cards on the table as far as this premise goes. Like these characters, they don't realize that people think they killed Cyrus until there's 20 minutes left in the movie. But I'm okay with that, honestly, um, because they're not sure if the general truce is uphold after Cyrus's death. So they're prepared for trouble when they go into other gangs territory. They know that's a thing that could happen. Right. Um, and honestly, I think that confusion kind of adds to, because if they know that, everybody thinks they killed Cyrus. There's no reason for them to trust any other gang whatsoever. Like, but there's already no reason for them to trust anyone. Well, these guys like they these know, gross boys, these gross boys, they know they're so far down to the totem pole that it wouldn't matter. Um, also the Lizzie's, they say that there's already part of an outfit. So if, and they know about Cyrus and the meeting uptown. So, there's no reason to trust them. I think them not knowing and them being in the dark adds to this sense of confusion and desperation that holds the movie for a lot of it. So I'm okay with them not knowing until the last 20 minutes. That's not know. their primary goal. Their goal is to just get home safe and they don't know what kind of obstacles they're going to go on the way home. Well, their goal is the same either way. Yeah. I guess my thinking is that, okay, if it if they don't know, then it doesn't matter that they were accused. 
Well, it does because it, do, it matters to us as the audience because we know the full extent of the shit they're going to have to go through. They don't. They're walking in there blind. Right. For a but lot we of it. don't. But we don't necessarily see evidence that they're being more dramatically hunted. Like they run into people by accident. You know what I'm saying? Only when they reach the Lizzie's is it actually a trap for them. And that's like an hour into the movie. Well, but the... Like the, they run into people. The bus people were hunting them because... But that could have just been happening because they broke the truce. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But like I want this movie to be more focused on people hunting them down. I guess. For what they did. But honestly, a lot of this could be avoided if they just weren't so stubborn and took off their colors. Like I know that's a big deal for them. Max, you never do that. I know you never do that, but like... It probably would make the trip home a lot easier. It's sewn onto their bodies. <laughs> they can't do it. That's why they don't wear any other shirts. <laughs> but, uh, oh, God. These orphans are just gross. Yeah, that's the whole point, though. Somebody's going to clip that for when I try to run for president and take me down. Talk about how gross orphans are. Yeah, yeah I said it. What are you going to do? I'm, I'm not voting for you. If you ever for <laughs> oh, and thank you. <laughs> vote for literally anybody else. I'll consider that a favor, <laughs> trying to smack some sense into me. Austin, don't do this. And then we have the wonderful introduction of female Woman. lead. Whoa. Isn't it a great? She's causing problems for this peace treaty that's about to go down, and you can see her nipples directly through her shirt. This is great. Oh, her name is Mercy. I think that's literally the only time we ever hear her name. Because other than that, she's just woman, female, love in 18 parentheses and an italics interest. She's, it's just, yeah. Not love interest. She's just interest. Yeah. Yeah, oh, God. So, yeah, I think this is a good time because we've been praising this movie to no end. And I think it deserves it. But we get the sexism thing where this lady comes and she's just a disaster. She fucks up what could normally have been just, Oh, these guys, they, they flattered the lowly gang enough so that the gang will let them through the territory. But no, she has to fuck it up. And then she tags along with them for the rest of the time for, well, I think, I think as the scene develops and the fact that the movie is committed to having her in the rest of the movie, you can potentially have the same moment as long as there's an actual internal character motivation that's really explored behind this. But they, again, they kind of leave it hanging. Like, it's okay to have a woman behave in stereotypically shitty, manipulative ways, right? If you're, gonna, if you're committed to exploring that in your movie. But I don't think this movie is, you know? And I think part of it has to do with the fact that uh, Windows here was actually fired from the movie prematurely yeah. because he got into arguments with Walter Hill. Because he wanted to have a bigger role in the movie. You know? I don't think it was that. It's just he he had demands and stuff. Well, no. Like, From what I heard, he had a bigger role in the original screenplay and they cut a lot of his scenes. And Guillermo del Toro's original oh craft. Oh my God, stop. Stop making that a thing. It's not going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to um, happen. But no, in the original screenplay, he, he, had more, squid. he had more of a role and then they cut a lot of it and he was kind of hurt, which is why he's not even present for his death scene. Um, no, I, I, from what I saw, it was, it was more that they, he was just sick and tired of his like attitude and shit. And they cut it because they decided to kill him because they were tired of his attitude. And that's why it's so awkward. He is originally set up as the romantic interest with mercy. And it was originally going to be that they're the ones that, that have the connection. But Instead, uh, it's Swan. Yeah. The very memorable character of Swan. Honestly, it's weird to me that they, you know, because really if they go in that direction, how many people do they even lose? We lose Ajax and we lose, I mean, maybe Swan and we was supposed lose to lose Fox. Yeah. And that's it. You know, that's kind of strange. But yeah, maybe Swan was supposed to die. At any rate, I think it's, it's a, it's mostly a failing because it's not fully, it's like a half baked idea, this character. And it feels perfunctory, you know, like it's the problem is that it's perfunctory. You can have women behaving in any way in a movie, as long as you're committed to exploring it. But and they're it, not. At yeah. All. So I think that's really the big problem. And I think this movie still manages to give her one or two interesting moments that are like an indication of how like, interesting that character should be yeah how, how they could have done it yeah even it, it feels weird at that time when they do it and then, yeah 
and and I mean, I think the she gives a decent performance for what she's given. You know, I think she's way more lively to watch than any of the or most of the warriors than at Swan. Least. Yeah. I think Swan is really boring in this. To be honest, I know it's a performance style that is just in Walter Hill's movies where he mutes everything and he brings it down to like a very basic level that's kind of automated, but. I just think it's boring. When and Swan especially does it. for this kind of movie, like I get the warriors, they're supposed to be the baseline gang. So you can't have them like too eccentric or too off the wall, but like it does venture into the territory of where like I sometimes confuse their names and forget them. Cause a lot of them act very similarly. And are just they just like, look similar. Yeah. And her main dude is just like, again, it's one of those weird things where my brain wants to auto complete his face yeah. <laughs> to James Woods. It's, but it's not, it's just like boring white guy. He, with no real distinguishing characteristics to separate him. And I guess that's the other reason why people are sort of like find James Remar compelling because he definitely looks different, you know? <laughs> and his face is expressive in a way that the other guys are not, you know? Like, what's the things... Of- <sighs> Why the fuck this whole scene? Just why this scene is happening? Yeah. Why did she go after them? Why ugh. they stop Ajax from having sex with her because they don't have time for that shit. But then they're about to any You could cut that scene from the movie and it'd be fine. Have, have the, the have, real question is like, what exactly are you supposed to be getting? Yeah, for, like, what does the movie think of that scene? And it's hard to tell because the, I think for us, the the Mercy character feels so perfunctory that it's like it's hard to understand what the movie really thinks of her, other than the fact that like she's into this, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, that's the thing. She's like, I'm looking for some real action, and. You almost want to take it as like, oh, she wants to be with like a real outfit, not these shitty orphans. Well, but, the the movie tries to develop that and yeah. say that she's like in search of like a, a satisfying real life instead of just sitting with losers, right? But like it's expressing itself in like rapey, aggressively sexual terms, which is the weird, like troubling part of it, you know? And yeah, if they had developed more of her character, maybe, but it's just at this point, it's kind of disgusting. And also like uh, that sort of interacts with the homoeroticism of this entire thing in a way that I don't entirely feel is like organic or natural. Like why exactly are they bringing her along? Yeah. Like she started running with them, I guess. I don't know. It's not like, like, it's not even like they have like a stated purpose for for bringing her along at first, when I first watched this movie, I thought it was like a hostage thing, like just in case, but it's not really that either. They just bring her with, because it's like, she's coming with us now, but it's like, these guys are so stoic in like that specifically like, um, homoerotic way. Yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, much in the same way. Maybe. It reminds me of the 300. Besides, I don't know. In 300, I guess you do get those scenes early on with him and his wife and like the, line about the like oh you Athenians are man lovers to try to diffuse the or deflect the inherent homoeroticism of of, of just their speedos <laughs> yeah speedos and shirtless men walking next to each other buttering each other up yeah and this movie does the, the same burdens. thing where we have Ajax use the other f bomb numerous times early on in the movie um and then oh yeah him, he says it a lot yeah and then him constantly talking about wanting to fuck girls just be like no these bunch of uh, shirtless dudes and vests aren't gay they they like women women guys trust me yes and i there has to be a better term for that other than like stoic male homoeroticism but that's exactly what it is where it's like they're stoic even to like women to the point where they're like very committed to just being with other dudes without shirts <laughs> Compare like, and that's the alternative to like respecting women at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? They could treat her like a person, but really what they want to do, what they like, what they enjoy doing more is just like laughing at her with their other shirtless dudes. You know, it's very weird. Yeah. No. This is a fake Ramones gang that the rogues are but hey oh let's go (laughs) but 
yeah, the rogues are sort of weird. They have like the that classic punk thing. They also have like some of the almost weird Nazi ish hats. Definitely. Yeah. And I think I don't know. I just think it's so interesting that that's the reason why why that happens. Because just because he's like, because I like doing things like that. Yeah. It just seems so appropriate. You know what I mean? And they're just, yeah, they're just the cops, a, ga- a gang of assholes. Yeah, ultimately, the cop, not even a gang. It's just one asshole, you know? And it's like the cops didn't even have to do anything to blow up the entire conclave. It's just this one fucking guy ruined everything because he likes doing that. Yeah. You know? He just likes causing trouble and. God, that just feels so appropriate for 2019. Yeah, of just like, oh, we, we're on the brink of this utopian, we'll run everything type thing, and just one guy manages to fuck it up because he thought it would Not be Not even utopian. It's just like we're finally going to do something different. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean. Like, Yeah. It, to be fair, like all the gangs banding together to run the city is a bit of a slight utopian idea, at least in their shitty world. Well, but. definitely it's playing off the, you know, prevalent idea at the time. This is very much a post MLK post JFK yeah. type of movie, you know, like you have the guy who's going to lead the progressive collective action against some sort of oppressive establishment. Right. But he's gunned down. And then because you lose that cult of personality, suddenly there's no infrastructure in place to keep, momentum going you know and everybody's fighting for themselves again yeah and yes we're we're introduced to well we split up because the movie needs to go in several different directions um really this movie is so much better in in the chase sequences than it is the fighting sequences yeah like all these subway scenes are just so beautifully shot and so well choreographed and it like this is just such a great like a suburban, not, not suburban, but like urban marginalized space movie, which is another interesting thing. Maybe we can pick that up from our conversation from Hellboy, right? And how, uh, you know, it's very sp- like deliberately explored in Hellboy. Dude. But goodbye, Windows. That's not, is it? What? I don't know. Never mind. But anyway, so the idea of characters going through marginalized spaces is explored very deliberately in Hellboy. And it's I think it's also explored here um, how their marginalized spaces are the just their mainstream spaces for them, right? But stuff like subways, graveyards, right? Yeah. Dilapidated uh, <laughs> carnivals. It's weird that we keep... Oh, here we go. What were you going to say? I I just want to take a moment to enjoy the baseball furies because even though they're not the most effective gang, they are probably the most memorable. Well, they yeah. have the best cardio because all they do is play baseball all day. Yes, they they run for quite a while. Um, yeah. Although I'm disappointed that none of them think to carry a baseball to throw at people because they, they. We're saying it'd be really effective if they had a van with like one of those automatic pitching machines something. attached at the top. Yeah. You can keep the theme, but. Come on, guys. You, you're or baseball grenade. Yes. It's got like a fuse coming out of it. That'd be great. That would be that. That would be might be a little too campy. They say bad up, and then they throw it up in the air and they hit it at them. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting you're talking about uh, marginalized spaces and whatnot because you know who ended up being a fan of this movie? Who? Um, Ronald Reagan. He even what called the director to talk about how much he loved this movie. Uh, what? Yeah, which is weird because it's like. Where did he... What is this? Tell me about this. That's all I know about it. That he's just a fan of this movie? Was, yeah. Is he just a fan of the skinny boys running around in vests? I don't know. I don't know what he saw in this. God, that man was insane. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, that's... I, I figured I should acknowledge that weird bit of thing I found, but... And the fact that he would just immediately be like, I love this movie because it shows me what I have to destroy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> This is a very good telling of what's going on in New York. Right We're going to make everything chrome and cameras everywhere. Get ready. I'm going to turn this into Disneyland. It hasn't even worked that well. Honestly, I went to Boston recently and I was like astonished because I was taking the subway. I'm like, it doesn't, it doesn't smell like pee. Not everything in the city smells like piss. So New York's not as like clean and sanitary and disnified as it possibly could be because Boston is Boston, but well, certainly it's better than it was in the seventies and eighties. Yeah. This is definitely like 
the low point of New York's just like may there's a lot of great like just destroyed 70s dystopian New York movies uh and this is definitely one of them cuz you know it's just it again it has to do with the marginalized spaces and the fact of people accepting like this dystopian <laughs> sort of post-apocalyptic reality as like the depart point of departure <laughs> yeah. for this movie's reality but it's really interesting by the way we're just not talking about how like clever this scene is when it's just them running you know and in fact this movie this scene is so good when they're just running that it just gets ruined when they start fighting the bad choreographed fights god it it's i don't even know if it's choreography it's just it's not shot well it's just not well done it's very clunky they're cutting around everything you know uh like it takes five shots for people to throw one punch you know (laughs) Yeah, and then you just have like the scenes over and over again of him hitting the baseball bats together in the same way. And yeah, stuff. and this this it's unfortunate because this scene is interesting when they're just like they're just running after each other, you know, and then it just becomes a generic action scene that's it's not well done. Really, I feel like this movie. Th- oh, there's our favorite line. That's your favorite line. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the back of his shirt looks like it says fries. Um, <laughs> But uh, the weird thing about this movie is I think it shows the value of having really creative set pieces for your action. Because again, it it is not successful when it's just them fighting. But it is successful when it's doing creative set pieces like them running from the bus or them going on like a giant foot chase with these guys, you know? I wish it had kept up the set piece of this throughout the entire sequence. Yeah, rather than devolve into this. Yeah, if they had been able to find a way where they were running the entire time but also fighting, that would have been great because then it adds something that's more dynamic than them just standing here. And it doesn't put your actors in a position where they have to fake punch each other so terribly that you have to cut around it. Yeah. You know? And, like, I get you have to have them fighting because they are called the warriors, so if they don't fight the entire movie, you're like, why are they called that? And they don't, they're bad at fighting. I just run the entire yeah, time. Yeah, I guess. I guess that's another thing is like, I feel like if you were more focused on the, them being hunted, it would create more of a like narrative impetus for them to not have to be warriors, but have to run, you know, and have to get creative for running. Maybe you could add something about that where like a big part of what they do is that they never run. So they're like on the back foot in a way that's very weird for them and they're not used to it, you know? Oh, oh no. And again, not to compare it to John Wick, but I too much, but I think that's something else that John Wick, I think, does very well, where it, it balances character relationships and it shows you how like one character doing one thing in one part of this community has a ripple effect on other characters' behaviors throughout the rest of the yeah. community. And I think this movie doesn't really do that as much because like we've been talking about, I think they would have behaved the other gangs would have been hunting them down maybe regardless, just because they're on their turf. Yes. So it doesn't necessarily change because Cyrus died. Um, it's just that I, I think that adds the looming threat of you have the rifts are going to be coming after them and the rifts are portrayed as like this gang that's so big that no other gang can take them on. Yeah. So that's, I think, less for our characters but more for the audience that's tension that we know is coming and is sort of a ticking clock in addition to the fact that we know they need to come back to Coney Island, even though when they do, it doesn't matter that much, but we'll get to that later. Hmm, I'm Now that I think about it, I don't really feel like they have a ticking clock, but that could definitely work at one. Oh, here's the Lizzie's. Um, where it's like, that would probably help because if if we see more evidence of the rifts actually like in the field after them, I think that would make it more compelling because it shows you that even if they don't know what's happening, they better hurry the fuck up. Because yeah. these people are right on their ass. Like have one scene where like yeah. some gang like isn't willing to cooperate, find the warriors or something like that, and just have the rifts like you fucking see what they annihilate do. Yeah. Them. Because I think I think we buy the authority of the rifts just yeah. by the fact of Cyrus being so important. And yes. they could summon everybody. But like it, it would be more interesting to me, I think, if you showed some evidence of them being hunted by the rifts in that way. I do wanna at least once. Yeah, let's put a pin in that, though, because... For this we wonderful get, scene. No, but we get two back-to-back introductions of secondary female characters in this. Yeah. And I think they're almost night and day, but they're doing similar things. So I wanted to talk about why they hit me in very different ways. Sure. Um, so right here, we have Lady Cop, who her entire mission, apparently, is to sit in the park bench and give eyes to any 
possible hooligans who walk by and then handcuff them to a bench and wait for the police to show up so that they can arrest them. She's so extreme about it, it makes you wonder if he had not started getting aggressive. Yeah. Would she still have like, because it just seems like you're consenting. And just say like, It seems like, yeah, no, it's it's clear entrapment, but who cares? Yeah, it's, whatever. It's post-apocalyptic New York. Um, And then on the other side, you technically have the Lizzie's doing the same thing, right? Yeah. You have them seducing these men into their lair so they can kill them. The only difference is the Lizzie's have a purpose. They're their own female gang that have carved out a niche in their own little territory. Yeah. And they're using what they have to do what they think is right. And like, listen, if Cyrus was that popular and that was going to benefit all the gangs and you generally thought the warriors had killed them, they do do a good job of like luring them into a place where they can kill them all. Yeah. And to be fair, that's really the only moment the movie shows us again of how like another gang group is interacting with the warriors specifically because they killed Cyrus. Yes. That's really the only one. And uh, it's important because that's how they learn that people think they killed Cyrus. So that motive is a big part of yeah. them, th- those characters. It also makes me like Rembrandt more because he's the only one who's not like instantly just like, oh, girls, let's let's get in this. And it might be because he's awkward and just kind of too young for this. Um, but I kind of like that he's the only one who's not just like an instant idiot about the entire thing of like, yeah, we're trying to get back to Coney Island desperately, but let's let's party with these guys for a little while. It sounds like a good time. Um, so yeah, Rembrandt, best warrior still, even if his namesake is dumb because he yeah. can't paint for shit. But compared to this woman, yes, this but, woman is just to come to think of it. We were talking about oh, there's no faces to the cops. She's the only real person that we get as a cop. And I guess the weird thing is like the movie just doesn't even take for granted that she's a cop to yeah. such a, a, like we, we never extreme see extreme extent. We never see a badge or anything, but she has handcuffs. I mean, we do know she's a cop because the cops are waiting for the whistle. Yeah. But like we technically never see her badge. So it's weird to think that she's just potentially some random woman. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think she has authority to say you're under arrest <laughs> if she's not a cop. But yeah, a lady cop. She's the only face of the police we get, and she's just entrapping this guy. Which, honestly, I'm kind of glad Ajax is out of the movie, because he's just... I don't know. I think he's the most interesting warrior. Yeah, true. He's his best performance. But, like... And I'm okay with him going this way. It's just, like, can we have something interesting after this with these characters? But I do like that fact that, like, the warriors aren't just like, no, man, we gotta, we gotta do this third thing and try to... Save Ajax. Yeah, get him out of the cop car real quick. And then no, he, he's he'll done. learn a lesson and he'll submit to the authority of Swan. No, fuck it. He's gone. Well, that's another thing I feel like this movie sort of misses an opportunity for is like if you had people getting picked off. Bro you know? building moments. But like you could that's if you're gonna compare this to the Odyssey, right? Yeah. Whenever Odysseus is gonna lose crew members, every island they come across has its own specific danger that is dangerous for a specific reason, right? So it's like on this particular island, oh, if you're greedy about a specific thing, that might be a disadvantage for you and you might per- perish because of that. Or if you're lazy, this island might be your weakness. Or if you can't keep it in your pants <laughs> yes then this island might then the sirens might get you you know what i'm saying yeah so everybody has their own weaknesses and different islands present different challenges for people and if you're going to do this type of story i think it would have been interesting to have more characters perish or at least have more episodes that challenge people specifically yeah and if you're gonna have a lot of the warriors be like just names and no personality traits that makes them ripe for killing them off and then, like, you have a couple. Yeah. You have a couple when you get back, and then, like, possibly develop them more rather than just sort of have the nothing. Yeah. Cause it, it is, is one of those things that I think, you know, the more people, more you subtract, the more you can add layers to the characters you're really focusing on. Right. So by the end, you have spent more time with them. Whereas this, I think it sort of more artificially creates that opportunity by separating them, you know? Yeah, I guess. And I do like the branching stories thing. It does give, I don't know, as much as I don't like the love aspect, like they do have some great moments together. Mainly, They do have some good scenes. Yeah. yeah. I just think it, like, it just doesn't come together in the way that it needs to, you know? And I, I don't really buy that 
this like this movie's on board with with actually exploring their relationship, you know? It needs maybe one more scene, I think. Really, it, it's, now that I think about it, if you had one more scene that really, like, sewed their relationship together... It could work it could a work. little better. But. I mean, I think the movie is just dismissive yeah. of her character a little bit overall. But if you were able to to get some more interiority from our lead here, I think that would help as well. Like the movie tries to explore her mind in several scenes. And I think that's to its advantage. But as far as our lead goes, the movie is never concerned with exploring what's going on in his head. You know, he's just our lead and we're following him and that's it. But I think if you were trying to do that in a way that was not just dialogue, it would help sort of explore his, his attitude towards mercy and thus inform how the movie feels about mercy. Right. I think that would help as well. So do we mean it like are the cops just told to look for like anybody in a weird outfit? But yeah, this is again, again, part of like the, the fact that they're just gang members. Yeah. Basically the cops are like this mindless blob of against our heroes because the warriors technically haven't done anything unless like they all have outstanding warrants or something like that. Like there's no reason the cops should be actively chasing them at every right. station. I guess that's the other interesting thing about like how this is masculine mythologizing is, is how like, I I feel like there's a specifically masculine thing about like being dismissive of like quote unquote sheeple. Yeah. That I think it is very specific to like the masculine self mythologizing that happens in this where, you know, the cops are just out to get them and that's so taken for granted that, that they're, subhuman in this movie right so well the lizzie's just let slip that they know about the meeting in the bronx which is our first clue that maybe they shouldn't be trusted i think the first clue that they shouldn't be trusted is just the fact that they're standing there yeah i guess that's the other prop like this is an interesting thing but i think it's like it is a little bit telegraphed you know that they that they're being hunted Also, I didn't bring this up early on, but I do like the fact. What? I do like the fact that uh, the Warriors are just sort of like a mid-tier gang. Like, the Rifts don't know about them after Cyrus's death. Like, they know they're in their network, but, like, they don't really know anything about them. And, like, when Cyrus is giving his big speech about, like, all the big rivalries, like, between big gangs, the Warriors aren't even mentioned. Yeah, he like, talked about the moon runners. Yeah, I, I like that because like... Because what? It's inter- it's it's a good hero plot point because if these gang, this gang is huge, one, you don't buy that they're going to be so desperate running back if they're like actually like a big authority gang and they're one of the big players. But also if they're a small time gang, then why were they invited to the meeting in the first place and why does it affect them at all? Yeah, it makes sense. It's a good entry point into this new community in this new world. I think that's the other interesting thing, if we're also going to compare this to Hellboy and, and the fact of them running through marginalized spaces and how those are their like primary spaces. Um, this movie is an interesting contrast to that because both also play with this idea of like an alternate history, right? So this gang world is like the subterranean world that these characters occupy in a way that's maybe comparable to Hellboy, but it's yeah. also their subterranean history. But I think the fact that this movie is so focused on mythologizing these characters is is interesting because it legitimate legitimizes that history, right? And it's saying this is the real cultural history of this city, right? You, is this conclave and these people. The rea- yeah, you top dwellers the rich and the cops and the mainstream you that's don't, not the real history yeah you guys yeah. don't know about what really is going on in the world you just you're not part of this mythology and that's interesting because yeah. even even in hellboy i think it, it's not cut and dry in that same way and this movie is not at all interested in in having characters who are concerned with integrating in the way in the way that hellboy is you know yes um these characters are very much I think of their time in terms of the countercultural thing where it's like, there's no question of whether or not they're going to participate in the dominant structure. You know, it's just a question of, 
can they get away from it? Or can they work out some sort of niche within it, right, where they can behave a, a, a sort of on their own terms? But there's no, like, need to integrate, which is interesting. Also, there is a bit of a lesbian undertone with the Lizzie's. Um, oh, certainly. And I can't tell if the fashion is supposed to be a giveaway for that or just everybody dressed like that in the 70s, but... I'm I see you know I'm not going to make any assumptions about 70s fashion. Yeah. I think 80s fashion is like the nadir of fashion. Yeah. <laughs> in the t- in the 20th century. Uh not that I'm some sort of expert, but I think 70s fashion is definitely the weirdest. So, I make no assumptions. Yeah. It's just interesting cuz they are dressed differently than any other even like lady cop is dressed like much more suggestively than the Lizzie's are, but the Lizzie's are the sirens of this. They're, they bring in all the people and then try to kill them. We have this scene, which is the first actual character building moment for girl. And somehow it just feels so unearned. Yeah. Cause I guess it's like, he's making assumptions about the way she lives, but I'm like, what about the way she lives? I don't know anything about the way she lives. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I guess you're supposed to assume that, like, because she was just, like, the resident lady of the orphans, she just sort of sleeps with anybody and is, like... What, that she's, like, some sort of, like... He's slut-shaming her, basically. Yeah. Well, he he calls her a whore who shakes her ass to get what she wants, like, when they first meet her. No, that's what Windows says. Although, clearly, he shares that opinion. Yeah. But it just confuses me because it's like, so what, you're you're this regulating monogamist guy? Yeah. No, I, I believe in the sanctity of marriage. <laughs> it's have, like, what? We shouldn't have sex outside the light of Christ. So yeah, <laughs> that's why Ronald Reagan loved this movie. <laughs> so. Did I mention I'm Mormon? Yes. Even though like earlier on, he's like, oh, maybe we should run a trade. Like, fuck you. Fuck you, Swan. And also like, does she really need to have sex right now? I don't know. I don't hold that. Like I'm fine with this character wanting to just fuck him. You I know, know? I, like, I'm fi- okay. I'm okay with her wanting to fuck him, but also there are more pressing matters right now. Like getting back to Coney Island before every gang in the cities and cops find you and kill you. Just, just a thing. Yeah, I guess I don't, I don't fault her for wanting to have sex in general. I fault her for wanting to have sex at this moment even if it does make for a fun shot. I wouldn't fault her for that. I'd fucking fault him for that. Well, he's the one She's who... not, like, aware of the situation, you know? That, uh, I guess I never thought about that because the orphans are so far down on the totem pole, she's not really aware of, like... And she's just been running with these guys. She doesn't really know what's going on, really. She just thinks that he's legit for some reason. And this is, like... And I think the real problem that we're having trouble articulating is how this movie seems too on board with his dismissal of her in this very specific, like, sexist way. Yeah. Where she's just like, no, I need sex now because it's all that matters to me. And he's It's just... like, you, I think the thing we're saying is you could literally have the same beat and the same scene, but the movie needs to be more committed to actually interrogating that in a way that I think neither of us feel it really is. Yeah. Whether because it's that scene or just the surrounding scenes or something about it, I just don't feel like it's really like as interested in that as it could be. And maybe that's maybe that is a sign of the times too. Like maybe if we were to watch this in nineteen seventies, we would feel it's more conscious of that than other movies. Yeah. But I don't know. Watching it now, it's like you could probably go further with that in a way that makes it pay off maybe more for us. But as it stands, it just doesn't seem that like interested in doing that which again is why it feels perfunctory it feels like a studio said that had to be in there i don't know because this movie is so homoerotic anyway it's like speaking of homoerotic we get some nice lesbian yeah dancing and then i think this is supposed to be rembrandt realizing that they're not into dudes so maybe we shouldn't would you say that this is some sort of implication of like rembrandt being more homoerotic than the rest of them. Because no. when I say homoerotic, I mean specifically male 
homoerotic, but it's also not like gay I, either. I, I mean, I just think like Rembrandt is almost portrayed as like differently abled or like special needs almost. Like he's just sort of out there and odd and weird. I wouldn't say special needs. He's just he's just not yeah. social in the way the the others are. But I guess the thing I'm thinking of is like the weird like fear of like gay women <laughs> that I just associate with like they'll yeah they'll lure you in with their womenly bodies and then betray you by being attracted to only women. Yeah, it's like this fear that because they're not attracted to men that they're dangerous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is why when we say that this movie is like homoerotic in a masculine way, it's not the same as saying that it's gay because it's very, it's, it's like a straight it's an, like, mindset. It's an idealization of masculinity almost. To the point of homoeroticism, but it remains straight, you know? That's, uh, that's the thing. If you, de- if you dive too far down into masculinity, you'll always end up gay. It's just, it's going to be in there. I'm sorry. Right. So they never... That's why in these types of movies, the homoeroticism can never be acknowledged. Yeah. Because if you acknowledge it too much, it makes people uncomfortable. But at the same time, they want to have no shirts on and they want to butter each other up. And they want to talk about how strong and powerful and good at fighting they are and just great. Yeah. And they want to shampoo each other. And yeah, so we finally we finally get the reveal. Yes, that. finally. And there's only 20 minutes left in this movie. Yes. Um, I guess you could say it's ver- paced very well. It is. So at the very least, even if you feel like these scenes are more of a slog compared to them just trying to run away from people, I think you know, it doesn't last stretch, very long. And I do like the home stretch of this film. Um, we get, we're going to get the best action scene in a bit. God, these this, these scenes are so beautiful. And we're going to get the most, uh, the best almost dialogue list scene coming up that's probably the best building of characters and talks about more a little bit of class struggle a little bit of the others versus what we can only assume is regular main society that they can never be part of it's the prom couple yes which is one of my favorite scenes in the movie which is weird to say in a fun i would say it's definitely my favorite yeah it's just weird to say that in like this movie because like this movie is like remembered a lot of just being like a campy movie of guys in different outfits in gangs hunting each other down, but it's weird to like have that like dialogueless, really good moment be such a great standout scene. I don't know if people talk about it, but like you're not hearing Ooh, people talk. Here it comes. This this is the spitting image of me in the first grade. Yes. The the con- the country bumpkin roller skate gang. This is exactly what I looked like when I was six in yeah. the first grade. I had my <laughs> My suspenders and my striped shirt. I see you've shrunk a little bit and don't have as long hair. But My eyebrows are much longer. Yeah, true. Yeah. You just took the hair from your head and put them on your eyebrows. Yeah. None of you guys know what Austin looks like, but it's it's utterly terrifying. Yes. Honestly. Just feet of eyebrows. If you if you go to that uh, subreddit, I'm sorry, John, that's what, what I look like. I'll take your word for it. I, stayed, I try to stay off Reddit at all costs. Um Yes, but these subway scenes in particular remind me of, uh, as I was saying yesterday, an American Werewolf in London. Yeah, it is pretty similar. Which is another movie we should get around to doing eventually. Definitely. We, we that movie's also very good. Yes. And also about regulating authorities. And yeah. Nazis. <laughs> yeah, there is some weird... Oh, God. We need to get off That our, movie is very much about Nazis. I know it is. I'm just, <laughs> I just, like, that put me back, because we've been doing a lot of movies where we just come just like... Are there Nazis in this? Hey, Max, man, let's Nazis! Nazis! <laughs> They should add that to does the dog die.com. Uh, there's okay. So we have skinheads in this. Yeah. Is that the closest this comes? Uh, unless we want to talk about the fact that I believe every cop in the movie is white. Um, Hmm. But I would say the rogues, well, we never get his name. The leader of the rogues. He seems like a not, he seems like somebody who would be a neo-Nazi. He really does. Uh, Not even though he just seems like a nihilist in general, just sort of like a fuck everything. Like, He's, no, because I feel like these nihilists are never people who are actually nihilists. They just call themselves that. I know, but like, I don't even want to like give him a political ideology almost. It's just like, he just kind of wants to fuck things up for the sake of fucking things Maybe up. Maybe it's because I just associate it with everything it, living in our post-Trump universe. It's like, I just associate him with neo-Nazis who are like, fuck you, man. Fuck you. Yeah. And they're just like shitty little 
insecure he is a shitty, dorks. He is a shit gremlin, but he's not that particular kind of shit gremlin. Well, at any rate, speaking of this movie's influence on uh, John Wick, he's in John Wick. And we do know his name. His name is Luther, by the way. Oh, yeah, Luther. Yes, we get only get that like once or twice in the movie, though. And we have her trying to be like, look, I'm street smart. I'm trying to help you. Yeah, I don't think the scene exactly works either. I think yeah. it just makes her look stupid because there's no one else in the subway station. Yeah. And also, they're only 20 feet away. Of course they know. Yeah. Also, did they just have arcade games in the subway back in the day? Sure, why not? Tell us, people. If you were in the subways in the 1970s, one, I'm surprised you've listened to this podcast. Hey, and... don't don't say that. Older people can listen to podcasts. I hope they do. <laughs> just beat the shit out of them for me real quick, guys. There's only three of them. We're fine. And uh, this is definitely the scene that Edgar Wright would copy in the world's end. I think Edgar Wright has copied this movie for a lot of things. You know what? Yeah. It. If you listen to whatever studio owns the rights to this now and is going to do the remake. No. Get Edgar Wright to do it. If no. you have to, I'd say no. Edgar Cause Edgar Wright, I think is not, he's never made a bad movie. It's a different discussion, Max. I'm not going to talk about it now. Well, we have a couple of seconds before the bathroom fight starts. What movie of Edgar Wright's do you think is bad? Baby Driver. Okay. Well, I disagree with you. I don't think it's his best movie, but I don't think it's bad by any means. I just think it's too much fan service for things. Walter Hill is literally in that movie. It's like, really? I mean, here's the weird thing about it is I love a lot of the decisions in it, but it's like, can you stop? I get it. I get that you like things. Stop. <laughs> stop enjoying things. How no, dare just you? stop making a movie that's just about how you enjoy things. Yeah. I mean, it was based on a music video he directed years before. It's so. a no, it's based on older car driving movies. It's based on the driver, basically. I, I know, but there is a music video he directed a little bit before, but like seven. Then years that before. is based on it, too. What I'm saying is it's it just feels so much like pastiche, and it's just like, oh, come on. It's not a bad movie, though. Also, Jamie Foxx is so good in that movie. <laughs> that makes it bad. No, the problem is that he's not, I don't want to spoil it. I know it's still sort of recent. I guess it's two years old, but like Jamie Foxx has got to be the final villain in that movie. Yeah. He's so good. He's the most charismatic out of all. The of moments them. it's, he's, he's gone. It's like, no, <laughs> he's so fucking good in that movie. He's, he is fun. Yeah. You know, I like to think I would be part of the lollipop guild, but this is probably the gang I'd be part of. The pumpkin roller skaters just because this is the way i dressed as a kid <laughs> i'd probably just fall into these this gang as like a five-year-old well i like this gang because like it. i can imagine hipsters dressing this way in the new york city subways <laughs> really? just, <today>. yeah. <laughs> just the denim overalls and roller skates like 100 percent. yeah part of the reason why i think this fight works better than the uh baseball furies well, it's well, it's well lit for one thing. We can actually see what's going on. I think the other one is well lit. I just think it's a more interesting setting. And yeah. also you have props to smack people against now, you know? And you have all of the remaining warriors together. Yeah, and I think weirdly it's... I, I'm sort of rejuvenated by the fact that they now know that the people are hunting them. So they're like, oh, we have to be strategic about this. And also I think weirdly I, just the fact that it comes later in the movie... The fact that it's cutting around so hectically, I think works to its, its advantage more because it's like, it feels a little bit more exhausting to watch. Yeah. And they're exhausted by this point. They're so close to getting home. But. Yeah. And it feels, this feels like a home stretch fight, you know, yeah. I think it works better than the baseball furious one. And also it's just cool to see them fighting with sort of more unconventional weapons like chains compared yeah. to just baseball bats. How many of them were there? Who knows? It's fine. We'll just keep hitting them with shit. Also, I guess it's, uh, I guess the other thing about the base, that's a great shot, by the way. Uh, the other thing about the baseball furies, both what makes them interesting, but also is kind of a downfall is how cute it is. Yeah. You know, where they don't really have a theme. I don't know if we mentioned this so far, but one of the things we talked about when we did the preview screening of this is how like, you know, at certain points in this movie, it reminded us of like a cheerleader jamboree. <laughs> 
<laughs> like a cheerleader rally. Look, it's the rival schools from the North Academy. Even yeah. The, and the prep school. Or like pitch perfect or something yeah. like that at the beginning. It's very silly. So we have uh, Luther's second in command betraying him and tired of his bullshit. This isn't Luther's second in command. I always thought it? it was. See, I got the hat and the. No, oh, it's I not thought the it same was. guy. Huh. Because you don't really, I don't think you see him in the final. It might make more sense if it, if it was. Because I don't think you see him in the final confrontation with the rogues and everybody else. Um, yeah, there's no indication of who that is. It's just some guy. Oh, this is my favorite scene. Yes. And we get the scene of the warriors talking about how they weren't completely on board with Cyrus, even though it seems like every other gang was. I don't think it's so much that they weren't on board with him, just like it is them having to grapple with the challenges of doing it in real life compared to just being inspired by a speaker. Yeah. And the sort of the challenges that I think would be very sympathetic to people at the time too, after they see these progressive leaders being gunned down, you know, and the struggle of having to recapture the clarity of vision that these, you know, sort of great leaders had when they've just been robbed from you. Right. So what culturally, where do you go? It's a hard question to answer. And they've been through all this shit. They've lost people. They've, just been in a huge fight, and then we get these people. It's just the most frivolous yeah. groups of people. Oh, we just finished up with prom, and we're getting the train back, and oh, look at this. And then they're forced. Everybody's the same on the subway. Everybody has to take the subway. Yep, and that's the great thing, because this movie combines the marginalized space yeah. with just like the mainstream space for this one moment, and it's just a really interesting, it's just a really interesting moment. And God, the actors do so well here. This is where the performance is really, like this performance style, it works so well. It's not even anything about them being a gang. It's just... They're uncomfortable with this. They're they're being dirty. They're a dirty, lower class person. And all the assumptions they're making about that. It's like, no, don't make yourself pretty for these fuckers. But You don't owe them anything. Well, it's not even... It doesn't even have to put any words to it. No, what I'm saying, like, the emotion tells all of that with anything, like... And then she closes her eyes, and this is what makes the scene perfect, is that we get that close-up of her closing her eyes. Because yeah. it's sort of communicating a thing that she's going to close their eyes and they're going to go away, like some sort of boogeyman, right? And And then by the time she opens them, they're gone. Or maybe even just, like, a brief, like, imagining what my life could have been like if I was on that side and it didn't have to be this way, but that's never going to happen. So back to reality. I just think it's such a great, it's just, that is the best character moment of this movie. And yeah. I wish we got more of that. Um, and that's, the, I really buy their connection in that one scene, you yes, know, without any dialogue, without any like force, like, why do you think this? Yes. And I, it's great because I think it still balances the, the type of masculinity that that character has while being genuinely interested in Mercy as a person yeah, in a way that doesn't feel uncomfortable to us, I think the way he interacts with her and forces her hand down in that scene, he's still behaving in the same way, but somehow it feels so much more um, less problematic and so much more interested in Mercy as a character than anything else, right? Yeah. So that scene really hits it out of the park, and I feel like the rest of the movie doesn't quite get up to that same level as far as their relationship is concerned. Yeah, let me get a nice little pinpoint. Fun fact, this guy became a born-again Christian. Really? Yeah. Gross. Maybe that's why he's so boring. Yeah, it could be. You know, the Lord can give you a personality? Fuck, I'm on board. I need one of those. And this is the only sort of moment, I think, where the movie actually questions the value of their identity. Yeah. And I have to be honest, I think it's kind of slapped on. It is. But it's just like, oh, we fought all the way to get here. Because the real problem, maybe it has to do with the fact of, of Windows being the intended character, maybe main character, right? And then this guy having to take up that mantle midway through the production. 
Um, oh God, we have some amazing destruction here. But I, I think part of it is just like, we never get any sort of perspective on his mind. Yeah. He's just so fucking stoic. Like, I have no idea what he wants individually. Yeah, and, okay, so we're back in Coney Island. We're on their turf, but the rogues just drove in like it was no problem. Yeah, I mean, and this I is... I know this is nitpicky, nitpicking, but dumb. also, like, it, it, it is sort of some weird questions. And just kind of silly. The fact that they're driving 20 feet behind them, and it's like, stay on their ass. Well, yeah, I know, buddy. Where else There's no there? one else here. We're not going to lose them, don't worry. I guess the other weird thing is that once they finally get back to Coney Island, they don't actually have weapons. They don't have weapons. They don't. I've because like I remember watching this for the first time. I'm like, oh, so they're gonna be like, you see, remember the scene when the orphans come crawling out of the buildings? Like we're gonna have that with like all the rest of the warriors. Like this is how they control the turf, as they have so many more members. No, it's still the same guys. But whatever, that's nitpicking. But it's something I would have liked to see. You know, the real question is why they're having this conversation about her taking care of herself or whatever. It's like, no, she hasn't proved that. I mean, I, no, she did. How? She, she contributed to the bathroom fight. She bit one of the people that was attacking Swan. Okay. She proved that she can scrap with the best of them. And at this point, they can't complain, honestly. They need additional numbers, so who cares? And then we have the famous scene. Yes. The- it's going to slam the bottles together. I do love this scene, and everybody knows the piece of trivia that this line and action were completely improvised by this guy, which is wonderful. But is that so? You didn't know that? No. Oh yeah. No. The, the dialogue and the bottles thing was completely improvised by him. And it, it's like the most iconic line in the entire fucking movie. <laughs> Just let him do it. Do you think he was doing that to annoy people? He was in character. And he's trying to just cause as much chaos as possible. Mm-hmm. He's talking to Walter Hill like at midnight or no, no at seven in the morning when Walter Hill is finally going to sleep. He's like, Walter, (laughs) Walter, come out and play. Yeah, no, that's why I don't know. I respect the actor a lot for that, for just like whenever you find out that like, well, he's certainly committed. He committed. It's a very committed performance. That's why it works. That's why it rides the line of being annoying, but isn't ultimately annoying. And really that's probably the most challenging role to play in this movie. I just looked it up. Actually, I was completely wrong. I, I always figured that, uh, no, not the improvising thing. That's what that's right. That I, cause I always, the, I've watched this movie three times before this now, What? uh, I always thought it was Luther's second in command that tattled on them to the rips. No, no, it's just it's some just, other dude. It's some guy. Yeah. I think it would have been better if it was Luther's second in command because like you have like those two scenes of him just being like, why the fuck are you so happy about all of this? This isn't good for us at all. Like to save his own skin from the rifts, just ratting him out. I think that would be fine. It would be a very roguish thing to do. I didn't know. Ooh, this is a beautiful shot. That's also a shot that feels like very much part of a Western where it's like the silhouette against the sun. Yeah. As they run across like the, just some sort of landscape. And in terms of landscapes, I think it's very appropriate that they finally, the big climax occurs at the sea. I think it's perfect that they're here at Coney Island and this is their home turf. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, oceans and movies, I think, are interesting because when you have characters going through some sort of conflict on the ocean, it's like a tabula rasa. And it's like, again, this blank slate and sort of like abstract space, right? You just have the horizon and then nothing. It's like this space where like ideas... And, like, identity can be broken down and then rebuilt. And that's what they do right here. Yeah. And also, it's just, like, the idea of, like, being on the edge of the world in a certain sense, right? Where they've come all this way and they finally reach the sea, right? (laughs) And it's weird. Because, again, I think the ocean is, like, like, a setting, too, where it's, like an idea of reflection as well where you're gazing out into something and it's like kind of introspective. And what is the grand answer for why they killed him? Just liked doing things like that. It's this weird irony, right? They're here at this dramatic setting with this endless expanse of space 
with infinite possibilities. And the simple truth is that he just likes doing things like that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> the, just the game breaking speed. And I love how none of the other rogues do anything. They're yeah. Like, he literally is going to walk over and take the blade out of his forearm and then wipe it on the dude's hair. Yeah. Which is a great power move, by the way. <laughs> I think of the, to be fair, if I was part of the rogues, I'd probably be sick of him being in charge too. Cause they were just hoping that they'd kill him. Well, you would have stabbed him first. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think did they none of them see them out of their peripheral vision? Have no, they just been standing there the entire time. They're very time? good at that. The rips. They're yeah. very quiet. Can you imagine if one of the rifts had fucked up and made a noise before their leader could have introduced them? Are the rifts gonna elbow him to death too? Just Luther? Just all of them elbow? I don't know. I don't know if that was the rifts or some other group. No, those were like the Shaolin monk ushers. No, those were those were the rifts. Um, okay, because you saw them when they were having the meeting early on. They were all in the Shaolin gear. I think this is just their other gear. Also, I feel bad for kind of the rest of the rogues who weren't Luther. I don't. Okay, <laughs> they did it. They all deserve it. They all passed the gun from one to the other. I guess they were yeah. all in on it. It was his idea for yeah. sure, but we did it. And now they're going to go. It's very awkward opening up. It's not very uniform based on what we've seen the riffs do up until now. Well, he wasn't looking that way so they could get away with not being disciplined. But if he had been, <laughs> they would have been in trouble. The guy looks a little bit like Harrison Ford. Just a little, yeah. Another fun fact, this is the movie Walter Hill did instead of making Alien. Really? Yeah. And you know what? I have to be honest. I'm glad we live in the world where he made that decision. Yeah. I mean, we get both movies regardless. It's not like we found out. It was like, oh, no, he was the, he was going to make this great side. He was going to make Star Beast. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Space Warriors. See, it all circles back around here on the Spectator exactly. Film Podcast. We planned it. And next week, we're doing It, the Terror from Outer Space. Yeah. Oh, God. I saw a trailer for the second part of the It movie, and it looks... I guess the clown from It is also from Outer Space. Yeah. Right? This is a different conversation. This has nothing to do with the Warriors. Yeah, but honestly, like, the movie could have kind of ended... Like, I get we need to see him. Just like, you want to go somewhere? Yeah, sure. Let's go somewhere. Why not? Again, it, I I think it it should work based on what's there, but it, it the movie is just never interested enough in exploring that to really do it. But I do kind of like the ending just visually. They're just walking down the beach. Yeah. They finally made it back, and it's the morning. And I think, it, you know, if this movie was more interested in exploring character, it would it would really pay off, you know? Yeah, it's a policewoman. She is credited as that. Okay. Okay. She is a cop, 100%. Yeah, that, that woman back at the park. But yeah, so interesting movie. I think I'm not settled in my opinion on it. I think there's a lot of interesting things about it. Definitely aesthetically, I think this movie is one of a kind. Yes, there's uh, nothing quite like The Warriors. And just in how it looks, I think, you know, I would watch this this movie a lot if I was going to shoot something in an urban area. Yeah, no, it, for guerrilla filmmaking, this movie is very, very good. Because um, it looks guerrilla, but also very expensive. Yes, planned out and whatnot. I mean, it's not like, yeah, no, it's not like the guerrilla level of some movies where like, you can tell they're just stealing shots. But Right. Um, like, they had to set up lights, but they do it in a way that makes everything look gross yeah. still, but like also very produced. It's very specific, and I, I just love the way it looks. And uh, yeah, I think this movie is very interesting from that sort of countercultural perspective. Um, weirdly enough, it was produced by uh, what's his face, uh, Gordon. Uh, what is his name? I keep thinking Bert I Gordon, but it's definitely not him. Uh, who also went on to produce Predator, I think. So, so I, I would say I probably right like now. this. Might be contra. I would probably rewatch this before I'd rewatch Predator, but that's just. Yeah. yeah, I'd have to disagree. Yeah, no, I'm just, I've never been a big Predator person, but... You could have a nice uh, homoerotic double feature, though, with like both of those. Apparently, Arnold Schwarzenegger's now entering the rap game. He's releasing rap tracks. Is that like horror franchises going to space? Is that old white men entering the rap game? I just think, yeah, just... 
people who are approaching the edge of cultural relevance. Arnold is still relevant. He'll be relevant till he dies. Yeah, but he's not like as relevant anymore. He just shows up in Terminator remakes. So yeah, but he's like King Kong. He's like Frankenstein, you know. <laughs> But no, like I think, yeah. Once once you're not as famous as you want to be, you you, you turn to rap. <laughs> you, you make a rap so or rap. Is he gonna do a collab with uh, Joe Pesci? No, Sylvester Stallone. Imagine Sylvester Stallone rap. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Oh god. But no, I yet again, I like this movie. It has problematic things in it, which kind of make me uncomfortable. But I think it's a good movie. I think it's one of a kind, and. I think it's definitely worth rewatching. I know I'll be rewatching. It, it really is a shame the problematic things in this because I feel like it is so close to being very interesting and kind of less problematic with those things with just a few small changes, you know? Yeah. It, Cause it does have those legitimately really great moments that it gives those two characters, you, you know, you could fix this uh, like in isolation that, that prom couple scene is just so fantastic. It's just so simple and beautiful. You know, it's like, that's amazing. But it, it, it is not holding up that standard throughout the rest of the, the movie. So, you know, I think this is definitely a movie I'm going to revisit. And I'm glad we did it for the show. And yeah. it, I guess it's always interesting when we do a movie and, well, none of our opinions on any of the shows we do are, like, exhaustive. Where it's like, this is our final opinion on this movie. No. If, but, you, if you have an opinion on a movie and you're not willing to change that opinion based on anything, that's more of just, like, blind devotion rather than critical analysis. Well, but. also, it's like... One, well, it's two possibilities. Actually, both of them would be true. It's one, you're not looking at the movie <laughs> movie properly, I don't think, yeah. if that's your way you're looking at it. And two, it's probably not that good of a movie if you compare it down so much. Yeah, true. That's why Christian movies are annoying. Because <laughs> they, t- they tell and you what that, it's about. And with that, <laughs> thank you for listening to the Spectator Film Podcast. We are available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, um, and we have social media, yeah, but specifically have... Letterboxd. Look for our Letterboxd because yes. that's cool. We Letterboxd on, is the best. Yeah, we also post on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram. No, well, we don't. Not on Facebook. Not anymore? Okay. No, never. Uh, do, 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 do. But yeah, so follow us all in there. Um, if you really like this content, and I have no idea why you do, feel free to drop us a couple bucks a month on Patreon so we can make the shitty show slightly less We shitty. don't have a Patreon. Yes, we do. No, we don't. I made us one. It's fine. No, we don't, Max. It's okay. Stop spreading false information. Give us, give us a couple dollars, please. We have to resolve this right now, real quick. I'm just gonna say, we destroyed the Patreon because we could not justify the idea of anyone paying us money for this right now. Pay us five dollars a month, and we'll stop. <laughs> Pay? No, that's gonna be a lump sum. First of all, <laughs> it's gonna be quite large. Um, but seriously, God, how could we ask people for money right now? <laughs> for our podcast <laughs> maybe at some point down the road um but yeah so just get in touch with us talk with us whatever you want to do yeah at least leave some uh, comments yeah let us know what kind of movies you'd want us to talk about in the future we're always open to suggestions next week we're doing a christian movie and uh yeah we better not be all right we'll talk to you later people <laughs>